Welcome to our final lecture, which is lecture 22, and today we deal with the monopoly. The prescribed reading is chapter 3 of Lipchinsky, Wilson and Goddard, 2017. What we will be focusing on is the basic properties and functioning mon of monopolies. So how do monopolies behave in the market? Specifically, we will go into the features of a monopoly, the types of a monopoly, profit maximization uh, and monopolies, allocative and productive efficiencies and the lack thereof or losses in efficiencies attributable to the presence of monopolies. We will also talk about measuring monopoly power and we will talk about the policies that can be instituted to regulate monopolies. Before we proceed, let's talk about the topology of market structures within the context of the neoclassical theory of the firm. What are the characteristics or specifically what are the types of market structures that we have and what are the characteristics of these market structures? So we start with perfect competition and on the opposite side is the so-called monopoly. So under perfect competition, we assume that there are many firms, there are no barriers to entry. In other words, there's free entry and identical products are being produced. This is why uh, under perfect competition, firms are price takers and not price setters, because they don't really have differentiated products, since, hence they are not competing on specific features, which might be associated with a higher price. And also there are many firms. So if one raises a price or their price for a given product, you simply go to another firm and you purchase an identical product from that firm. Then what we have is imperfect competition, and so there are two subcategories under this. There's monopolistic competition. Under monopolistic competition, we have many firms. There's free entry, but there is some differentiation. And then, furthermore, we have oligopoly, and under oligopoly, there are few firms. There are barriers to entry, and there is some differentiation. So that does differ slightly from monopolistic competition. Finally, when we speak about a monopoly, what we have is one firm. Uh, there are n or no entry is possible because uh, entry barriers are so high and it produces a very different product for what else is out there, out there in the market. In fact, it produces the only type of product um, of its kind. There are no other products like it produced by other firms or similar. Otherwise, it will not be a monopoly. You could buy the same product or a very similar product from another firm. So we will not be dealing with a monopoly market structure. So going a little bit further, what is a monopolist? A monopolist is the sole supplier of a market. Uh, specifically, they supply a specific good that nobody else supplies. And obviously a monopoly is then some firm it is a firm that is the nature of the, end, of the entity and produces some product. And that firm has 100% market share. In other words, you cannot buy that specific product from anywhere else. So, for example, the Royal Mail would be an example in the United Kingdom because it is the sole supplier of stamps and has a monopoly on them. No one else supplies stamps that can be used to post letters uh, and uh, packages. So that is why the Royal Mail is then a monopolist in terms of stamps. Now, how can monopolies arise? Well, first of all, government restrict entry by giving a single firm the exclusive right to sell a particular good in certain markets. Uh, such examples would relate to patents, where you have a firm that can produce a given uh, form of intellectual property or at least something that relies on research, such as a medication. And also copyright laws where there is only one publisher that can sell a specific book. Another example could be a telecommunications monopoly, which is the only one that is licensed to provide landlines, which can be used to make calls. So even though there might be competitors in terms of communications, that specific uh, firm would still be a monopolist because it is the only one that could sell landlines or provide the service of landlines. Also, you may have a so-called natural monopoly. So a natural monopoly will, will arise when a single firm can supply a good or service to entire market at a smaller cost than 
the two of them could, or two or more firms could. So therefore, monopoly arises when there are economies of scale over the relevant, ra uh, relevant range of output. So an example would be here is when you have a supplier that has been operating in the market, let's call it the incumbent. And yes, others could enter the market, but you have such high sunk costs that this deters other firms from entering the market. And hence, you have a natural monopoly that arises. It is able to supply at the lowest cost because it might, for example, have a network of landlines or telecommunication, a telecommunications network, and can't be challenged because the sunk costs are so high. So now let's go down a little bit further into the characteristics of a monopoly. So what are these characteristics? First of all, there is only one seller. So that is the key feature of a monopoly. Yet there are many buyers. So you have one supplier and many buyers, and those buyers can only buy from that firm. The selling firm's demand function is the market demand function because it is the only seller of the product. Remember that we would add uh, the quantities sold of a, uh, or the quantities demanded by all individual customers for products produced by different firms if we did not have a monopoly. But on the other hand, the demand for that product of that firm's products is the only demand there is for that product. So hence what you have is the selling firms representing the market demand function. And the reason why this matters is because it is able to determine the market price. It is a price maker, not a price taker, as it would be under perfect competition. There are high barriers to entry, so it's difficult for other firms to enter the market and to compete, or otherwise there is simply no entry into the market. It's not possible because the incumbent might require a license or might have a license and be the only license holder that will provide that um, good. The good or service produced is unique and there are no substitutes. Again, if there were substitutes, then it would have less of a market share or it would be less of a, you could argue that it wouldn't be a monopoly in 100% sense of the world because you could get a product that can, that can fulfill the functions of the one that that specific monopolistic firm is uh, selling. In other words, there is complete product differentiation. It sells a product that cannot be purchased anywhere else. Again, this goes back to the reason why we are dealing with a monopoly. The buyers and sellers may have perfect or imperfect information. So uh, buyers and sellers might know everything there is, or they might not know everything relating to quantities and prices and other aspects of the market and the product itself that is being sold. And then geographical location could be a defining characteristic, which gives the selling firm its monopoly position. So, for example, you might have a number of competitors in a specific market, uh, but some of those or most of those competitors don't operate in a specific geographic locality. What is the consequence? That there is only one supplier to that locality. So, hence, you have a monopoly arising in a localized area. Although nationally, there are numerous competitors. Here you have a activity, the features of a monopoly, and I encourage you to watch the related video. And um, if um, you are not, uh, um, if you are with others, uh, please discuss with the person sitting next to you um, about the particular features of a monopolist and how this can relate to a freelance journalist exhibit. How can a freelance journalist exhibit be related to a monopoly? So that is an interesting question. It's a matter of applying the theory. So I encourage you to give this a shot. Let's talk about the reasons as to why monopolies were may arise. Well, a key characteristic is a barrier to entry. If it was easy for other firms to enter a specific market where the monopolist operates, then we would not have a monopoly because there would be competition now. So what are these barriers to entry? Well, here we have three listed. So first of all, ownership of a key resource, a resource that nobody else, no other competitor has access to and is able to obtain. 
Also, what may happen is a government may give a firm the exclusive right to produce some good, such as Cyafrix's Telcom, where what you have is a license that is granted to one holder to provide landlines. And then costs of production make a single producer or may make a single producer more efficient than a number of producers. So, for example, let's say a water utility. Um, having numerous water utilities would mean that uh, the network uh, has to sometimes be duplicated to deliver to uh, different neighborhoods and even sometimes to neighbors if neighbors subscribe to a different network. So the result is that you might it might not be efficient for more than one firm to function given market. What does long run equilibrium uh, in a monopoly look like? Well, we go back to the profit maximizing condition and the profit maximizing condition is central here. And this is something we covered in the previous lecture. This is the point where the long run marginal cost is equal to the marginal revenue. So as long as the marginal revenue is above the marginal cost, associated with producing an, an additional unit, it makes sense for the monopolist to produce an additional unit. So a monopolist will then produce this quantity that corresponds to the intersection of the marginal uh, revenue equaling to the marginal cost, and that will then trace up to a specific price level. And here we have a restatement of these uh, stylized facts. And um, what we can also add at this point is a monopolist is a price setter. The average cost is given by C subscript one, and that traces to this point here on the long run average cost curve. Now let's chat about allocative inefficiency in a monopoly. And what we do is we look at surpluses again in order to gain insight into the situation. Just as a reminder, so what is allocative efficiency? It describes an allocation of resources such that no possible reallocation could make one agent better, producer or consumer, uh, without making at least one other agent off, which is again the producer or consumer. When we talk about economic agents, we talk about the participants in the economy. And as you will see, what happens is that there is an impact on the producer surplus and the, produ and the uh, sub uh, consumer surplus. One of the necessary conditions for allocative, effic allocative efficiency is that the marginal benefit to society as a whole of an additional unit of output being produced equals the marginal cost of producing that uh, additional unit of output. Let's think about it. As long as the marginal benefit of producing an additional unit exceeds the marginal cost, that means that the marginal benefit or the benefit from an additional unit that is added to the total benefit is higher than the cost that is associated with producing that unit. So it makes sense to keep on producing more. The condition that is then required is that the price is equal to the marginal cost. How does uh, allocative inefficiency arise due to a monopoly? Well, first of all, let us begin in a situation under perfect competition. What would the producer surplus be under perfect competition? Well, there is no producer surplus. There is only a consumer surplus. And that consumer surplus under perfect competition is this triangle here. Now, let's say monopolist restricts output. What is it that happens? Well, the consumer surplus falls. This is now the consumer surplus. But the producer surplus rises. So the producer surplus is this rectangle here, B. So what is our deadweight loss? Our deadweight loss is then the triangle C. So that is when we see allocative inefficiency arising due to restriction of output attributable to profit maximization by a monopoly. So why is a monopoly less desirable than perfect competition using an allocative efficiency criterion? Well, first of all, what we saw from the previous slide is we have a reduction in the consumer surplus. 
we have an increase in the producer surplus relative to a perfect competition, but we also have a dead weight loss. Furthermore, the price paid by within a monopoly smear market structure will be higher than that in the case of perfect competition. And the quantity sold under monopoly will be lower than in the case of perfect competition. So that is why we do not want monopolies. Prices faced by consumers are higher and the quantities that they can purchase are now lower as a result of a profit maximizing monopoly. What other inefficiencies arise? Well, we have productive inefficiency in a monopoly. So what is the definition of productive inefficiency or productive efficiency specifically? A firm is efficient in production if it has achieved both technical efficiency, which we'll go to now, we'll define now, and also economic efficiency. Specifically, technical efficiency relates to a situation when a firm is producing the maximum quantity of output that is technologically feasible, given the quantities of factor inputs it employs. Then we turn to the issue of economic efficiency. So this takes place when the firm has selected the combination of factor inputs that enable it to produce its current output level at the lowest possible cost. And we, as you will see, a firm or a monopolist might not be economically efficient. And we'll discuss why that is the case, why it may not be producing at the lowest possible cost. So in other words, a monopolist might be technically efficient, but economically inefficient. We then return to this question of whether monopolies are productively efficient or are they productively inefficient? Well, um, it is likely that a monopoly will be less desirable based on a productive efficiency criteria. And why is that the case? Well, the reason why is that monopolists are usually not the lowest cost producers, so they don't achieve economic efficiency. And the reason for this is because they're shielded from outside pressure. Remember that what drives innovation and what drives or provides an incentive to keep costs down for a firm in terms of producing products is competition. Now, if you remove the competition because there are no competitors, well, what is it that happens? You tend to have firms are no longer economically efficient. In other words, they don't work hard to keep their costs down. And that is the case with monopolies because they simply don't need to. They are the only seller of a product. And if you want to buy that specific product, you have to buy it from a monopoly, from that monopoly. Furthermore, a complacent monopolist might not strive to make the most efficient uses of its input. So what we have is technical inefficiency. Again, there is no competition. So hence, there is no incentive to be efficient or alternatively, there is no incentive to be cost efficient in using the inputs. And this brings us to another issue. If a monopolist is not making efficient use of inputs, in other words, not aiming to achieve technical efficiency, in other words, a monopolist is technically inefficient and is also economically inefficient, the result is that monopolist operates on a higher long run average cost curve and a lower long run marginal cost curve. Relative to what a monopolist could operate, operate on if it faced competition, which required it to achieve or forced it or at least encouraged it, motivated it to achieve technical and economic efficiency. So recall the size of the dead weight loss when we don't achieve allocative efficiency. Why? Because we are producing too little and we are producing at a price that is too high. We have this level of dead weight loss, whereas this is now the consumer surplus and now this is the producer surplus. How does economic and uh, technical inefficiency then contribute to a further loss in welfare. Well, what happens is that average costs increase. How is that represented? That is represented by an upward shift in the long run average cost curve. What are the results of that? Further output is reduced. So uh, initially we were producing here, but now when we've introduced economic and technical inefficiency, what we have is we have a further shrinkage of output. 
Now, what this means is that there is an additional dead weight loss, and that dead weight loss corresponds to this new area here. Also, what happens is that there is a shrinkage in producer surplus. So as you recall, producer surplus was previously this. Now what has happened? It is only this. So that is now the producer surplus. Furthermore, what also happens is that the consumer surplus declines. So previously, the consumer, de uh, consumer surplus was uh, given by this area here. Now it is being given by this area, D to be specific. Now, how do we measure market power? Well, this follows on from a monopoly, but it does not only relate to a monopolistic industrial structure. Recall that there are other forms of industrial structures, such as monopolistic competition and uh, by extension also an oligopoly. But the basis of a so-called learner index, which is the basis for our measure of market power, is perfect competition. So under perfect competition, you have many firms and they all produce identical products. So what happens if one of those firms tries to raise its price? Well, you will shift your business to the other firms that operate in that market. So hence, it is unable to raise its price, otherwise it loses business because there are many alternatives. This is not the case for a monopoly. So under perfect competition, the price is equal to the marginal cost. Now, when we start having a monopoly that produces only a product, a unique product, the only product of its kind in a market, you have to buy from that firm if you want that product. You have to buy from the monopoly. So what does that mean? Well, that the monopolist can raise its price because you have no alternatives. And that is exactly what a monopolist will do. So it has market power. Of course, in between you have uh, monopolistic competition and also oligopoly and uh, it firms that function in these industry structures can have some market power. But then we return to our measure of market power. The idea is that the learner index is the difference between the price and the marginal cost divided by the price. So that is what gives us market power. Of course, if it is greater than zero, what this means is that either a certain firm or um, the entire industry, or sorry, a certain firm has a degree of market power. So therefore, what would the learner index look like for perfect competition and also for a monopoly? Well, if the price is equal to the marginal cost, as would be the case under perfect competition, then this whole entire term is zero. So the learner index is then zero. On the other hand, if the price is greater than the marginal cost, then the learner index will lie between zero and one. So it will be greater than zero and less than one, assuming a positive marginal cost. We can also rewrite the learner index in terms of one divided by the price elasticity of demand. Recall what, what the price elasticity of demand looks like under perfect competition. There is perfect elasticity. In other words, any small change in the price for a product offered by a given firm results in a massive drop or an almost an infinite drop in the quantity demanded. So hence, it will be extremely high, if not infinite, as we see on the next slide. So therefore, again, the learner index would be close to zero in such a situation. This is demonstrated on the next slide. Thus, if we restate the learner index using the price elasticity of demand, what we see is that as the price elasticity of demand is infinity or nears infinity, the learner index is zero. Think about it, or near zero. Think about it this way. If the price elasticity of demand is very high, we are facing a perfectly competitive market structure. Why? Because consumers are very responsive to any change in price. And why are they so responsive? Because they can purchase anywhere. Alternatively, if the price elasticity of demand is greater than one, so it is not infinite, we are dealing with a monopoly where the learner index will lie between zero and one in that situation. So that is how the learner index can be restated in terms of the price elasticity of demand.
Now, how can regulations respond to monopolies? So the idea is to control monopolies, to prevent some of the uh, losses in efficiency and the exploitation or the high prices that are charged by monopolies. But of course, that is associated with allocated inefficiencies. So what is it that government can do then? So government can make monopolized industries more competitive. It can regulate the behavior of monopolies by limiting the prices that can charge or setting quantities that needs to produce. For example, it can use a zero profit policy. So a monopoly needs to produce at a point where it just breaks even. Um, it can turn some private monopolies into public enterprises again. The idea here is that falls under government um, control and the idea is that government can control it and prevent it from making abnormal profits. But the problem is always that government might be captured or start siding with the monopoly and hence regulation becomes ineffective. Also, government can choose to do nothing. Therefore, turn in terms of within the context of discussing uh, regulations, we turn to um, how antitrust laws can be used to increase competition. So what are antitrust laws? Antitrust laws are a collection of statutes aimed at curbing monopoly power. In other words, a collection of laws um, and acts. And antitrust laws give government various ways to promote competition. So they might allow a government to prevent mergers. So, for example, you have two producers of a good in a given market. If they merge, then there is only one. So hence we have a monopoly. They can also allow government to break up companies in order to prevent them being monopolies. So it splits it into a couple of parts. And uh, ideally, these parts now should begin competing. And also they prevent companies from performing activities that make markets less competitive. So what can government do about a monopoly? Well, it can regulate. It can regulate the prices that a monopoly charges. One potential solution that you will see is a little bit problematic on this slide and the next slide is that the allocation of resources will be efficient if the price is equal to, to the marginal cost. So one solution is to set the price equal to the marginal cost. However, the problem will be that the long run average cost will be above the price and therefore the monopoly will be making a loss. So we don't really want that because there's a potential the monopoly will go out of business. So what we do is we allow the monopoly to set to, to keep some of the profits from lower costs in the form of a higher profit. But that requires us to depart from marginal cost pricing. In other words, we don't set the price equal to the marginal cost. We set it a little bit higher. Alternatively, what um, government can also do is it can take control of a monopoly and therefore we have a public ownership of that monopoly. The problem is that publicly owned enterprises usually don't work because there's no incentives to be efficient. Um, or at least they don't work as well as those that are run privately because there's a stronger profit motive for private enterprises. So let us take a situation or take a look at the situation itself. Let's see what it would look like if or what would the situation look like if we set prices equal to marginal cost. That is what we look at the next slide. So what happens if we set the price equal to the marginal cost? Well, the result will be that this is the point that we are at. Um, this means that the average total cost is higher than the regulated price. Now, this means that the monopoly is losing money. This is not what a situ the situation that we want. We don't want the monopoly to go under. So instead, what we can do is we can set the price that ensures zero profit. And this is the point where the price is equal to the average total cost. So this is the solution. So here the monopoly is just breaking even. It is not making a profit. Alternatively, we can set the price a little bit higher, and this is when we allow the monopoly to make some slight profit. The point is, this is a departure from marginal cost pricing. So we allow the monopoly to keep some profit or just to break even. However, the problem is that sometimes regulators might be captured or they might start championing the cause of the monopoly. 
So this situation then no longer occurs where we have a limit on the profits or zero profit pricing. Instead, what happens is that monopolies start maximizing the profits because they've captured regulators. And the regulator is ineffective or instead starts championing the interests of the monopoly. The final solution is that of doing nothing with a monopoly. Remember that whenever there is an attempt to intervene in a market and pass a policy, this results in some degree of inefficiency. So what we have is we have imperfections arising due to public policies. So if the market failure arising due to a monopoly is smaller than that that arises from regulating a monopoly, well, we would rather simply do nothing. So it's choosing one of the two devils. And one would choose the devil or the evil, better saying, or better word, that results in a lower levels of inefficiency. What are the takeaways from this lecture? We looked at the monopolist's uh, um, profit maximizing condition where the marginal cost is equal to the marginal revenue. This results in a suboptimal quantity that is produced, a dead weight loss, and a reduction in a consumer surplus, although there is a producer surplus, but nevertheless, there is a dead weight loss. We also looked at the allocated efficiency, and then that obviously relates to the existence of a dead weight loss. We spoke about productive inefficiencies, and that relates to technical inefficiencies and economic inefficiencies. And we also discussed a measure of uh, monopoly power by using the learner's index. And finally, we spoke about what government can do uh, through regulation and through trust laws in order to limit monopoly power or prevent them from arising in the first place.